take the issues one by one. You just talked about some of your members uh, receiving threats. You just mentioned acid attack, for instance. What is the evidence? And have you given the evidence to the security agencies? So this is, this is a very interesting and funny question, and especially the way in which you, you, you frame it. Uh, the fact that I'm telling you that there's a threat uh, against a person's life, that's in itself the evidence of the threat, right? Uh, unless you're presuming that, you know, we're just making this up, right? No, like, what I'm trying to uh, ask... That would, be, that would be an interesting way to, to put it. What I'm trying to uh, ask... In fact, we've seen people die. Let me give you an example. Macho Kaka was, was killed for his activism. You know, persons in the jail came onto the street to demand for answers regarding the death of Machukaka were shot on by the military military of this country. And a, a, a committee that the president put into place found that the use of force was unjustified. It's not surprising that people have continued to have fear uh, about activism and mobilizing, right? And these are questions that we need to treat uh, seriously. Mr. Uh, but one of the things... What I'm trying to say... Bakavoma, yeah. Yes, Bakavoma. Okay, what I'm trying to say is... You're just giving the example of the, uh, the incident of Kaka, which a committee, as you just mentioned, the committee investigated it. We already know the, as it were, balanced, quote-unquote, uh, report that the committee came up with. Yes, there have been challenges with it. But I, I asked you the question about evidence of this attack on uh, th the people you mentioned, which you said are part of you. I asked because I believe, and you're a lawyer yourself, when there is a threat on the life of somebody, you report to the security agencies and yeah. give evidence. That is what I asked you. Have you done that? So, so let's, talk, let's wait a sec. Let's talk about this question of threats of attack on on if your adult's life and uh, of, of of threats of accident attack. The person then in this context decided that like when I look at the kind of threats and I'm facing, and in fact, you can even add to that social media abuse. She decided that the best thing for myself is that I'm going to wash my hands from activism and I'm not going to do anything about it because it's not worth, worth the cost of my life. That is a rational response by a person who is, who is mobilizing. And let us not pretend that so we do not know the kind of police force we're dealing with. And that people, the significant survey that shows that a lot of people have very little faith in the police force. And so let us not treat it as if, unless you go up and go and report a particular thing to a police to the police institution that you have very little faith in, that it doesn't happen. Right? The ways in which you decide to choose or you decide to respond to a particular issue that is threatening your life or your way, the ways in which you do activism, uh, it's, it's for you to determine what makes you feel safe and what may better protects you. So and that's one of the things that I, I am very encouraging of. And we are generally encouraging of activists when they come under such kind of attack to determine for themselves, you know, uh, what best works for them and makes them feel safe. Do I get the understanding that uh, this uh, supposed the talk you're talking about, I'm using the word uh, supposed cautiously because I don't have the evidence to it. You did not report to the police because you do not trust that the police will do what it has to do. What I'm saying is that I have received so many attack uh, threats as an individual and so many of those threats I do not talk to the Ghana Police Service about it. In fact, I take my own security measures, which does not imply that, uh, uh, you know, yeah, which a lot of it is also due, built into the fact that I do not, in fact, trust the Ghana Police Service. Uh, but it's also beyond that, right? And in the particular case of the TRW, she is entitled, that's what I'm saying, to determine for herself whether or not she wanted to go ahead and, and press a case against them. In fact, there's so many things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day that we kind of determine for ourselves what is the best response. I'll give you another example. Uh, and and uh, Abronia DC, as it's called, has gone on and made claims about, you know, we've been funded by the opposition party, claims that if, if your daughter, for instance, was being taken to Dubai and being shopped around, all kinds of obnoxious things, right? And the question that we had as a legal team to determine for the country was, do you sue this individual? knowing that you can be stuck in our court system for nearly six years and you know at the point at the end of the day it becomes a period picture like what 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 is more important in a particular instance and in so many instances those judgment calls have been made and it's not a new thing in terms of the way in which we we, we mobilize it is it is a continuous part of the ways in which we we organize in fact a lot of the times some of the threats that we see come from the ghana police service itself so it is almost uh, laughable, I would say, 
that the, that the source of some of the threats we receive would be the ones investigating the threats to us. Like, yeah, that doesn't really engender confidence in the situation. You're, you're, you're accusing the police. The police is not here to respond to that. Uh, once again, I'll say that I don't have the evidence uh, to substantiate what you're saying. <laughs> but again... Um, I should have... Which is an idea that this is the way the conversation would go. I would have printed a whole lot of documents and scanned them and sent them to you. Okay, but... And I, I would say refer to exit appendix, appendix 2 of... Well, uh, I think that when you, uh, I, I think that when you make, folder. I, I think, think it's important, right? I am making the direct claim to you as a journalist who is talking about the challenges of activism, and I'm getting. Well, you should have photocopied or you should have sent me. I don't have the evidence. Whenever I see well, the, Mr. Bongo, I think the point that. I don't see I, I, I think we can have a smoother conversation. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that if you're making an allegation and the other yeah. person to respond to the allegation is not on, I cannot just uh, rub it off and say that, okay, that's what you said, and so let's move on to the next. But I want to ask you a question about the fact that you do not trust the police and it's even laughable, quoting you here, that you report uh, something to a police service that is itself threatening you. So what would be the purpose of telling me who would not uh, or doesn't have all the equipment to investigate these claims when the right agency that is supposed to be there you have chosen not to report to, to, to it? <laughs> um, you know, you um, and I are having a conversation about the intricacies of activism in Ghana, right? And you talked about, you know, ways in which other activists uh, uh, have, you know, been less upfront about the activism and engaging in that. And I'm telling you directly that some of the reasons why they're doing that is because of the difficult terrain of activism. And the difficulty and some of the experiences they've had, that's why. Now, I am not coming to make a complaint to you to investigate this claim. We are talking generally as conversation, an intellectual conversation about how activism works, you see. And so this is not about, you know, trying to find forum with you or anything in that regard, but so that any person who is listening and understands the, the, the intricacies of Ghanaian activism would also understand the, the, the things that activists face on a day-to-day. -day. That, that, I think, is the context of the conversation, right? Mm. Well, yes, we are supposed to discuss and see the way forward on this. Uh, but I was, I want to take you back again to another point you made before we continue with some of the other things that have come up over the last few months. You mentioned that um, that was debunking uh, the, the claim, as it were, of the Economic Fighters League that you are a partisan political party. You denied that. You said that you're certainly a political party. And you, when I asked the question about funding, you started by answering how it is important for the country to investigate the sources of partisan political parties in the country before you went on to answer this uh, very question and said that you're sponsored or given funding by uh, open society so you're not a partisan political party but you believe you're a political organization what kind of political organization are you so the, the endeavor of, of, of conversations in a republic, in a, in a polity like ours, entails political conversation. The idea, you know, everything is political. In fact, food is political. Even the ways in which we plan the country is political. And so in that sense, we yeah. are in fact a political organization because we're talking about political issues. Uh, you could say, I mean, perhaps the distinction between that is, say, the church, for instance. But even religion is politics. So the church is, first of all, a religious organization and is political because religion itself is political. So that's the sense in which I mean it. I'm not talking about we are not, we've not mobilized as a political part. In fact, what I said in response to that was that the, elect the Economic Fighters League wanted to contest elections, which is not in the DNA of the country as we speak. But we are a political organization, and our political organization relates to the fact that the conversations we raise, the issues we talked about, relate to the politics of Ghana and the ways in which power relates to persons who are calling it to, to account in that regard. Now, the CDB recently did a survey where it shows that a significant amount of money that goes into political party financing, which the country is not political party financing, it's mm -hmm. money that comes from, uh, from criminality, from corruption and all kinds of various nefarious things do not, that do not help or augur well for the health of Ghanaian democracy. 
Uh, and I, you have talked about you know, funding that the country has been trying to raise and the grants we've received. It is, it is, an, it is particularly in the ways in which, because we have a democracy where very few people fund civil society, and there's no public funding for civil society organizations, uh, almost all of our civil society organizations are competing for the subventions or the grants of, of Western taxpayers, right? Which is, whether it is the uh, US aid funding or it is the GIZ or all kinds of, you know, foreign funding that is helping keep the Ghanaian civil society space alive. In fact, that is, that is the nature of the civil society space uh, to seek for funding. And that was the same kind of thing that we have done. And we are very, we are very transparent about the source of the funding. That is why you know, for instance, that it's an open society grant, right? I mean, what we uh, are, the, the absence of transparency in the political space in terms of political party financing is something that must concern all of us. Mr. Fumo, you, uh, you talked about Open Society, and I've just gone to the website of Open Society. Um, it said Open Society Foundations, uh, what we do. It says the Open Society Foundations are active in more than 120 countries around the world. Our national and regional foundations and thematic programs give thousands of grants every year towards building inclusive and vibrant democracies. Our vision is a call for change change in the way we think about others and in the ways we work together. Change is now more present than ever amid the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I, I want to stress on the fact that uh, this, uh, this organization is talking about towards building inclusive and vibrant democracies. What did uh, you say you would use the funds for I in terms of building democracies? Because you say that uh, what your, disc or your focus has been on has been uh, developmental issues in the country. So in this case, where you've received this funding, is that what you're doing, uh, putting the money into so, a vibrant democracy? Um, so yes, I mean, we haven't yet received the money, so we're still going to the paperwork. So. But I, and I think that when we do when the money does arrive, we'll have a whole conversation around the various activities that we're implementing. Uh, some of them are the idea to hold town hall meetings uh, with young people across the country to dialogue about constitutional reform that strengthen our democracy, that limit, you know, abuse of power and the power that state institutions have. In fact, you know, direct activities that go to the heart of how do you make a democracy more vibrant? How do you make it more inclusive in terms of participative, less participative nature, right? So yeah, so these are conversations that we have down the line, right? But I do, I am, I am, I'm in, I am, I am sure that we will engage a lot of media folk and journalists in this conversation. And I now know your your your, your huge interest in this area. I, I promise that you'll be part, you'll be a big part of the conversation. Uh, when we start implementing activities under the grant. You want to use the grant to have town hall talks, uh, telling people about uh, the constitution, and I believe that the country obviously is governed by the constitution. I said earlier that your lawyer, part of the constitution is the security agencies. They have their role to play. You have just said in this conversation that you don't trust them. So what kind of conversations are you going to have with them when you're already uh, slapping another system that is supposed to ensure law and order in the country in the face? So this is the thing. The, the practice of democracy means that citizens don't become praise fingers of institutions that they interact with. In fact, they hold them to account in terms of if, they, if you consider that trust is lacking in the police for this service, for instance, or in other critical democratic institutions, as so many other services are found, the bigger question then becomes, okay, what needs to be done to enhance trust in, our, in the institutions of our democracy? And we've had that one conversation already, right? Like we held a press conference where we talked about police violence and extrajudicial killing. And we've called for a commission with powers to investigate police brutality and incidences that lead to death in, in law enforcement. This is a critical way in which people see that if law enforcement can be held to account, there's accountability in the institution, it engenders trust. You see what I mean? So that process of, of holding institutions to account and seeing that accountability mechanisms deployed and working, and does engender trust in the institution. And these are the kind of conversations that you know, purposeful town hall meetings and civic education can give you. 
you see. So that's the kind of conversation that will be driven, or we have continued to champion since the very beginning. And the more we engage citizens, the more we can think about what are the ways in which we can expand uh, the, the way citizens can interact with these institutions to better improve our democracy. And you so that's the, the ways in... Yeah. You, don't, you don't think that in the midst of this, and that institution that you hope to improve must be part of it. And at the end of the day, there must be a sort of a balanced platform where the police is not accusing you of being a monster, and you're also not accusing the police of being uh, lawless. You know, um, I, I think that we need to be careful in the ways in which we discuss institutions. Now, the police is an institution of our democracy. It's, a, it's one of the key aspects of our democracy that help to engender faith uh, in, in, in our democracy. Now, if citizens say they lack direct trust in the institution, the, the police cannot say that, no, cuddle me or sing my praises before I can engage in the critical conversations around reform, you see. And so what you have then is citizens are raising critical concerns about an institution that they pay for, an institution that belongs to the people. And the people are entitled to engage in a conversation as owners of their democracy and as owners of this institution. The institution cannot say that, oh, you have criticized me, and for which reason, no. With no changes that improve the substance of our democracy are welcome. I don't, I don't think that that's the practice of government, um, uh, generally. Mr. Vumar, you talked again about developmental issues because you say that uh, these are also part of what you're doing. It's not just about constitutional reforms. Now, two uh, decades ago, the country permitted freedom of speech. In recent months, however, there have been reports of police arresting and detaining journalists over comments that uh, some professionals have equally condemned. I would not say that two wrongs make a right. Again, uh, the Media Foundation for West Africa, uh, an international civil society organization, identified 150 violations against uh, Ghanaian journalists. Uh, these are institutions we are talking about here. You're already uh, saying that you don't trust them and all of that. Oh, what exactly are you going to do to make sure that the system works as part citizens are supposed to be part of development so the process of contributing to development for citizens we generally think is that first of all citizens must gain the confidence of being able to you know to directly speak truth to authority and that process entails where if citizens have direct concerns about the ways in which government machinery operates or anything operates, you speak about it. I'll give an example. Uh, one of the sister stations, the multimedia group, heard like, you know, call-in programs where different people, parents called in and talked about the free SHS program. And they talked about the frustrations they were experiencing and how it was impacting their lives. Now, the state can view this and say, okay, this is direct feedback, right? about how do we improve the, uh, a key or uh, flagship government program and make it work better for the people. Um, but you saw the president's response. He says, you know, people were, you know, run the campaign against the government and, and that. That's a, that's a disappointing way of reviewing the issues. Because an analog, we can create the same analogy with the kind of conversations we are having. But Mr. Where we are saying, these are the ways in which this is what we are feeling in respect of this situation.